Good morning and welcome to the 11th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone to please switch off their electronic devices or to silent so they don't affect the committee's work this morning. We have apologies from Willie Coffey, MSP, and Kenneth Gibson is attending in his place. Welcome, Kenneth. Item one is decision on taking business in private. Do we agree to take item three in private? Yes. Thank you. Item two is governance of public bodies. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, Bill Thompson, Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Bodies in Scotland, and Ian Bruce, Public Appointments Manager in the Commissioner's Office. I'm going to ask Alex Neil to open questions for the committee. Morning, Bill. Um, the the re if you, if you look back at the reason why we decided to take a closer interest in this whole process, it basically arose from the evidence we got uh, in relation to the Scottish Police Authority. But the issues that were very much highlighted there could be applied to many other public bodies. For example, we've been dealing with NHS Tayside recently, uh, where substantial issues uh, have arisen and matters have not worked out the way they should have done. We've uh, uh, looked at uh, various other public bodies in the time we've been here since the last election. So th this is not exclusively the Scottish Police Authority, but can I pick the Scottish Police Authority to start with as a very good example of where I think we all believe that there is something not quite right with the public appointments process. Uh, the Scottish Police Authority is now on its third chairperson. Uh, the first two chairs, to say the least, were not outstanding successes. Uh, they obviously had gone through what was supposed to be a very thorough process before being presented to the Cabinet Secretary as possible candidates uh, to take the position. If you look at the role of the non-executive directors in the Scottish Police Authority, it's hard to find one of the previous... I'm not referring to the new appointees, but of the previous appointees, it's hard for us to find one that obviously was doing the job they were meant to do. And indeed, quite the opposite appeared to happen, and that is that members like Mr Barber and Mo Ali appear to have been victimised um, for uh, doing the job they were meant to do by the then chair. So where we are sitting... The public appointments process, certainly in relation to Scottish Police Authority, has not been a raving success. Comment. Uh, Convener, there are, um, in my remit at the moment, 96 regulated public bodies. Um, and Mr Neil has mentioned two in which there have been rather well aired difficulties um, um, I mean, I've I think if you if the question is whether the process um, fails to deliver um, I think it would be better to have a sense of the extent to which failures may exist um, um, I think the process has a lot of merit. Um, I'm extremely aware that Mr Neil presented a bill in 2001 which um, would have led to a different process and probably prompted uh, the current Act, the 2003 Act, uh, under which I operate. Um, as I suspect all the members of the committee will be aware, and Mr Neil particularly, having been a minister, um, the appointment by the ministers based on a code of practice, um, w which was drafted by and adjusted by my predecessors, but in consultation with both uh, Scottish ministers and the Scottish Parliament, uh, and it has three criteria and the uh, principles, uh, and the main one is merit. So, and I appreciate that the point of this question goes right to that issue. Um, so appointments are made on merit, um, and in simple terms, merit is identified at the outset, at the start of the appointment process, by the minister, or at least on behalf of the minister, uh, and that is in fact the job specification which should link 
to the requirements of the board uh, and the person specification in terms of their qualities, skills, experience and knowledge uh, that are being looked for, that has to be signed off by the Minister at the start of the process. Um, the second principle is integrity. So the process has to go through on the basis that these are the criteria for appointment. Um, it has to be open and transparent and there cannot be any change. So in other words, new criteria cannot be introduced part of the way through the process. So what I'm coming around to saying in rather a long-winded way um, is that you get at the end of the process what you look for at the start of it. Um, and if you are not satisfied that people who are appointed at the end of that process um, are sufficiently capable, uh, then I think it leads to a question as to what was identified at the outset as being merit. Um, what were the correct things looked for at the outset? Well, having been a minister, obviously I've got, and particularly in health, which the health secretary appoints more public appointees than any other cabinet secretary or minister. Um, and you're right, the minister signs off the process. But the minister, let me give you an example, um, or many, uh, what happens. The minister doesn't see any names until he or she is presented with the final two or three. Uh, now, I, I, when I realised this, I asked to see the names of the original applicants. And some of the people who were turned down that I knew would have been much more eminently suited to the job than the people who were recommended to me, in my view, in many, many, many instances. Um, I'm not going to name names, obviously, it would be inappropriate to do so. And, you know, it seems to me as though one of the reasons that motivated the changes in the public appointment system was obviously to make sure that politicians just couldn't uh, appoint their pals, as it were. Um, and I think in that objective, we have been successful. But it seems to me as though that, you know, uh, there is a, a group of people, I mean, there are some people who appear regularly in public appointments um, and hold more than one public appointment. Another example, when I was health secretary, was there were two people who were in the regulatory body of the health service while simultaneously on boards of, of health boards. And it hadn't struck anyone until I raised it and duly disposed of the services uh, on the regulatory system that somebody who's a part of the regulation shouldn't be sitting on the bodies that are regulated. That, in my view, is very poor governance. So there's a whole load of issues. And we saw with the Scottish Police Authority, inevitably, Bill, with any process, you're going to get one or two appointments that don't work out for whatever reason. In the case of the Scottish Police Authority, which, when it was at full strength, had about 16 board members, it didn't appear that any one of them were able to do the job that they were supposed to do. I don't have an answer for that. Um, well, the system of these people are getting through, and then other good people are not getting through the system. I'm not an expert on the difficulties experienced in the... Scottish Police Authority, obviously, I've paid attention to um, this committee and others' examination of the issues. Um, but I think what you're getting at um, is the problem of a group of people not behaving the way that you think they ought to. Don't um, I think they ought to. If you're a non-executive director, the rules, you know, the, the expectation of a non-executive director is very clear. I mean, there's plenty of written material from the Institute of Directors and many others about what the role of a non-executive director is. And we were very hard put to find any non-executive director from chairman downwards in the Scottish Police Authority to find out anyone who was actually doing the job they were appointed to do. Um, I mean, obviously, if that's the committee's position... Um, all I can say is that in terms of the public appointment process, the people who were appointed met the criteria for appointment. If well, they didn't need... then, um, if I may continue, um, if they didn't then behave the way they were expected to do, um, that could be a flaw in the public appointment process. It could be a different reason. Well, so, uh, yeah. Mr. Neil, I'm 
Maybe, Mr Thompson, I can draw your attention. We took evidence from, just a few weeks ago, from um, a couple of members of the Scottish Police Authority. One has since resigned from the SPA board. But in terms of looking back at governance issues, we felt as a committee their answers to our questions were extremely poor and showed a real lack of understanding of or, or detail or recollection or any of these things of what had gone on. I mean, you said you'd played, paid close attention to the committee. I wonder if you saw that evidence session and you could take that as an example of did you feel that their performance kind of came up to scratch? Um, this is going to irritate you. It's not meant to convene a... Um, the performance of board members, once they are appointed, is completely outside my remit. Mm. And I'm not trying to be awkward uh, with the committee. I'm here to try and discuss the issue constructively. Um, my remit goes as far as ensuring that the appointment process is conducted properly, um, which, as I've explained at some length, means that the criteria which are set out at the beginning are the ones which are used to assess the candidates, if they don't then perform, um, it could be because the criteria were set out wrongly in the first place, or it could be something to do with the circumstances in which they find themselves, and I, I don't have an answer for that. People who are doing the interviewing aren't getting it right. I mean, we don't know the answer to the question why they're getting it wrong. What we do know, certainly in the case of the Scottish Police Authority and a number of other organisations, is in the case of the SPA particularly, they got it massively wrong in terms of what eventually happen. So that suggests there is something flawed in the process. Now, it might be the criteria, and I know, you, you know, that's that's set. Uh, some of this is set in statute and, and in secondary legislation and so on. So I realise the limits of your remit, Bill, uh, and I realise that once they're appointed, it's not part of your remit to monitor their performance. That would normally be done by the chair of the board and subsequently the minister, and it's then up to the minister. Um, and, a, and there's a separate issue there about why ministers allowed things to go on as far as they did in the Scottish Police Authority. But if, if there's one or two out of 16 who are not performing, we would expect that in the, in, in the real world. When you get 16 out of 16 not performing, it suggests there's something fundamentally wrong somewhere as to how 16 people who are not up to the job all ended up in the job. And, and what we're looking for is, why, why do you think that happened? I, I'm sorry, <coughs> Convener. I, I'm not um, trying to obfuscate in any way. I don't know the answer. And I'm not in a position to comment on all of those 16 people. And I'm not wholly sure that you are, actually. Um, but in general terms, I think the chair appointment in any public body is critical to the way that the body operates. Um, I don't know if I, I... I simply don't have an answer to the question as put to me. Um, I don't monitor their performance. The chairs are responsible mm. for monitoring the performance of all board members. No, but the point is you would want to be in a position where the people you appoint uh, are, generally speaking, with, there's always some exceptions, are up to the job. I mean, in the SPA, we've run to a third chair. The first two proved to be disasters. I think that's a commonly held view in the parliament and out in the country. Um, and therefore, it suggests there is something wrong with people coming to the top uh, of the selection procedure who, at the end of the day, you know, are not up to the job. There's a systemic... There appears to be a systemic problem in the process. I'm not in a position to identify any systemic problem in the process. Um, I've suggested one of the things is whether the criteria are set in the first place. Um, I don't actually have in front of me the criteria that were set for the two appointments of the chairs um, which you're talking about. I believe that the criteria were adjusted uh, prior to the appointment of the current chair of the SPA. Um, the way that the board operates, frankly, is... Um, something I, I can't really comment on. The only thing we're doing at the moment that might help 
uh, is some research into the impact of diversity on the governance of boards, which may contribute some light on the subject that you're asking me about, but uh, we're not in a position to publish uh, the results as yet. Mr. Just um, thinking for the public record, it might be useful um, for the committee if you could just briefly explain what your role in this process is then in the public appointments. As I've mentioned, there's a code of practice for ministerial um, appointments to public bodies. Um, that was drawn up by my predecessor uh, as the it was a slightly different role. Um, and that sets out the basis on which um, appointments to public bodies, regulated public bodies, are to take place. Um, where, the, the, where there are high-profile appointments, for example, the chair of almost any public body, and certainly the chair of the SPA, um, there is a public appointments advisor. Um, there are 13 of them who are contracted to my office. Um, they are independent, they're experts in HR issues generally, but particularly in selection uh, and appointment. Um, and one of these will be allocated to the process. Um, one of the improvements which has been made to it um, in recent years is that there is um, early engagement with the advisors to the minister, uh, and sometimes actually to the, uh, with the minister, him or herself, um, to discuss the needs of the board and in that context, identify what is required and therefore the criteria which will be suggested to the minister uh, for the appointment. Um, the planning for the appointment round also includes discussion of which, um, which means should be adopted to try and attract uh, a wide range of candidates. Um, and by the way, one of the things that we have been trying to encourage is to reduce the number of criteria. The more criteria you put out there, the more specific you make it, uh, the narrower the field of people who feel that it will apply to them. Um, there are different ways of trying to attract people into a role. Um, some are quite novel. Um, social media obviously wasn't an issue when this act was first um, promulgated. Um, so there are a number of different ways. Um, and then there is a selection process which tends to be by way of interview, but there are quite a number of alternatives which are permissible under the Code of Practice. The Code of Practice is not specific as to the means that have to be used for assessment. Um, and so do these 13 people um, conduct the interviews? No, they for, don't. No. Um, that was the system in England and Wales uh, until recently, where the equivalents there would chair the panel. Um, if there's an interview, the interview panel is normally chaired by uh, a senior civil servant from the department advising the minister. Um, it is quite common for there to be the chair of the body. Obviously, that won't always happen, uh, or a representative of the body. Um, in many cases, there will be an independent panel member, uh, and we've issued guidance on the qualities required uh, for that. Uh, and sometimes another civil servant who will have experience in public appointments. Um, we, through the Public Appointments Advisor, offer briefing to the panel. Some are very experienced. Uh, they don't need much by way of briefing. Others are fairly new to it. Uh, and we give guidance on unconscious bias and, and other aspects of the process. Mm. Um, so your 13 advisors are responsible for really getting a pool of candidates together and then it sounds like it's up to civil servants to make the decision. That, I'm afraid, is oversimplifying. It's the appointment panel chair's responsibility who will tend to be uh, a senior civil servant. Um, but the advisor will advise and support. They are experts um, and they're aware of good practice. Um, so, yes, they, they will support and be part of the panel in a high-profile round like that. Okay. Mr Neil, I interrupted you. Do you want to continue? Yeah, just a, a request for information. It would be interesting to see how many people actually applied for appointments over the last year or the previous year uh, and how many got through in terms of uh, the percentage who end up you know, being nominated or in the shortlist. It would be interesting to see uh, if that was possible to categorise that by previous job because uh, there's certainly a suspicion that uh, there's a very high percentage of 
retired civil servants end up in the short light. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, Bill, but Kavina, it's I've heard it, heard it said. Um, that was one question I had anticipated. <coughs> um, over the last two years, um, there have been 45 appointments as chair of a public body. Um, 20 of the people appointed had a private sector background, and five of them had a, a mixed background, if you like, between different sectors, including the private sector. Um, in the year when the previous chair to the SPA, and for that matter, the uh, NHS Tayside were appointed. Uh, there were, I think, 97 appointment rounds in total. Um, and there were 1,790-something applicants. Um, I can't remember the precise figure, but uh, over, over 1,790 applicants uh, in total for these uh, rounds. The number of applicants per round is, it's not huge, but it is steadily rising from about 14 in 2010 to 18 or 19 per round. That's an average, obviously. Um, and the numbers who apply for chair posts tend to be lower. And that's true in health, which Mr Neil knows about. It was interesting, the 45 figure, you said 20 were private sector, five were mixed sector. Does that mean the other 20 were ex-public sector? Um, they will have had public sector experience, yes. I, I just, you know, there's, there's certainly a, a lot of people who have, I, I've spoken to down the years who have applied and uh, feel as though, you know, there's, there's a built-in bias towards the likes of retired civil servants. Whether that's true or not, I do not know. But the, the point is, uh, very clearly, um, we're ending up with, uh, certainly in the SPA example, but also if you look at the health boards, I mean, the number of, health boards where um, the chairs have had to be removed, for example, the latest one being NHS Tayside. When I was there, I had to remove the chair at that time of NHS Grampian, as well as the chief executive. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a fair number um, who have not performed. Uh, if you look at the health boards themselves at the moment, you've got NHS Tayside, you've got NHS Ayrshire, which is uh, suffering significant financial difficulty. You've got NHS Lothian. Um, now, I'm not saying that's because of, in every case, poor chairmanship or poor non-executive directors, but there is certainly a concern. Now, it might be, I mean, one of the other factors influencing this is the remuneration. And I know a lot of people do this, particularly once they're retired, not for the remuneration, but because they want to give something back into the community. But um, for some for somebody who's the chair of a health board, um, their contract is usually for three days a week, and very often they end up working five days a week. So remuneration may be an issue where we're not attracting the calibre of people for these top jobs in particular, because at the end of the day, if you're running a health board, the chances are you have a budget in hundreds of millions of pounds, and in some cases well over a billion pounds. Uh, so. One of the questions I would ask you, and the final question I'll ask you at this stage is, is the remuneration may be an issue. You said, you know, you don't have a flood of applications, and I know in some cases it is difficult to find people to, to, from whom to select, enough of a pool to select. So is remuneration a possible reason why we're not sometimes getting the calibre that we need? Um, of course it could be. I don't have um, firm evidence of that, but um, self-evidently, yes. Short answer to a long question, but yes, yes I, th I think that's appropriate there. Ian Gray. So, Bill, what, you talked a little bit there about what's in and not in your remit, but one of the things within your remit is the ability to conduct audits and reviews. Is that right? Yeah. I just wonder if you could say something about those and what would prompt you to undertake an audit. Um. We, I, I will hand over for the detail of this to Ian Bruce, um, who, who's more directly involved. Um, we gather information from um, those who are in the appointment panels to see if they have any concerns. Um, we also gather information from applicants uh, to establish what their concerns are. Um, and we have conducted uh, on an annual basis, reviews of the process, but I think, it, I, in fairness, I'd have to ask Ian to explain uh, the reasons why some uh, of the appointment rounds are selected 
for closer examination. Um, so the last thematic review we conducted, uh, I suppose I should preface this response by um, indicating that fundamentally what we're engaged in and the work that the public appointments advisors are engaged in is um, enabling the government to continuously improve on the practices that it adopts. We are looking at trying to embed best practice in recruitment and selection. And so uh, our reviews are aimed at making appropriate recommendations in order to improve on, you know, fundamentally the, the outcome of any given appointments process. Our last thematic review uh, made a number of recommendations that we're currently following up on. Uh, one of those was that the Scottish Government should have a more systematic lessons learned process. Um, and um, so without wishing to go into too much detail, the practicalities of that involve we survey applicants at the end of each and every appointment round. Um, we gather their demographic data, including the sector that they've come from. We um, gain an understanding of their views about different aspects of the process, areas in which it could be improved upon. That information is then fed into selection panels as part of a pack of management information. It's about process improvement, more effective outreach, redressing underrepresentation by protected characteristics, uh, and also adopting application and assessment methods that are appropriate for the target pool. Um, perhaps traditionally there's been an over-reliance on competency-based assessment at the early stages, and we know that potentially has been a barrier to people from the private and voluntary sector. So the lessons learned process um, helps our advisors to recommend to panels things like um, why not use an application that asks people to provide their life history if it's experience of governance, for example, that you're looking for to fill a particular post. So um, the thematic reviews, as I say, make recommendations. One of the other ones the last time was that there wasn't a good understanding necessarily in terms of participants' understanding of um, diversity. Sometimes that's confused with um, protected characteristics, but as committee members will understand, it's the range of attributes on a board that contributes to good governance. So the mix of skills, experience, perspectives, backgrounds. Um, and again, that's something that we're now pursuing in our current thematic reviews. The follow-up is in terms of succession planning. So ensuring that uh, boards have an understanding of what their needs are, that's communicated to the minister in order to identify what they need for um, their activities going forward. Uh, and also the lessons learned process, whether or not what we'd encouraged government to do uh, had become in embedded. So that's, that's what we're engaged in currently. So I, I suppose my question really is, if we take a specific example where governance has clearly failed or run into problems, be it the SPA, NHS, Tayside, other, there are other examples that Alec Neil talked about. Could that or would that not provoke or lead to an audit or a review by your office? I think there are different issues here, um, and I'm sorry, I appear to be pussyfooting around. I'm not. Um, the implication of the questions that have been asked so far is that because the people who've been appointed have not performed as was expected, therefore there was something wrong with the appointment process. I think that's what Mr Neil's questions were driving at. I think it's also what Mr Gray's question is. The implication is there, it, that might have been the case. Indeed. I, I don't think we know. Yes. Um, and the difficulty I have is that um, I would be driven back to establishing whether trying to establish whether the process identified the best candidate in terms of the specification at the outset, which isn't going to answer the question that I think is troubling you, and obviously quite rightly. But, but, but surely that's not the case because you, you, you said earlier, Mr Thompson, that the first principle which the appointment process was designed to deliver was merit. Indeed. So if there appears to be an instance where the process has failed to deliver the required merit, then surely that begs a question about about the process, the process itself, which is, is your remit. Um, 
I'm going to repeat myself, convener, and apologise for that, um, but it is the correct answer. Um, I also said that merit is defend, defined at the outset, um, and that's signed off by the minister. Um, what you're actually asking about is merit in terms of performance in the role, maybe a year or two down the line. Um, and in some cases, the response to issues which may have developed but may not have been properly dealt with uh, before that person as chair was appointed. Um, and there are different questions in there, and I don't think my remit would extend to what is effectively an assessment of the performance of the chair, or for that matter, as Mr Neil said, the whole board. So if, I, so if I understand you, your answer to my initial question really is no. So a, a failure in, for example, the SPA wouldn't lead to you auditing the process. So the, the converse question is, what would then? What, what would prompt you to audit a selection process? Um, accepting that in some cases um, we will do a random selection of processes. So that, that's not what okay. we're talking about. Um, failure to attract applicants. Okay. Um, errors in the process. Um, we, we did have one which went quite high up in the system where what had happened was that the information collected by the selection panel was not correctly reported to the minister making the appointment. Now, that was obviously a fundamental flaw with the process and resulted in uh, errors being made. Um, I think I think we would also look at um, lack of diversity. Um, you know, if, if uh, appointment rounds continued to fail to attract, uh, even in gender terms, uh, a proper diversity of applicants, we would be concerned about whether the um, criteria had been set properly and whether it had been advertised properly, um, whether it had been promoted properly. Um, none of which really drives at the point which interest you, I'm sorry. Do you feel in any way constrained by this then? If you look at a board in which you or your office, it might have been your predecessor, had oversight of the appointment and the governance has clearly failed, does that not prompt you to think, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't we be concerned about that? Um, of course I am concerned um, because like you I'm Concerned that but you're public bodies deliver, you but I don't concerned. think my remit allows me to look into the performance of those who are appointed. Do you think there should be changes to the 2003 Act to give you that to give you that power? Um, the short answer is no. Um, I don't think I would be the appropriate person to examine the performance of people appointed to boards. Um, as I've mentioned before, that the theory is, and I believe the practice, that the performance of board members is assessed by the chair. Now, if there's a problem with the chair, there may well be a problem with the uh, performance, uh, the assessment of the performance of the board members. The, the performance of the chair is assessed by the senior sponsor within the, the government, who will be a, a senior civil servant. Um, I think and this is not rocket science, the whole thing, the success of it depends on the quality of relationships um, between the minister or the minister's department and, and the public body. Uh, if there's a miscommunication there, then things are almost bound to go wrong. But I don't think uh, my office would be the right one to look at the performance. Um, I actually think it's more appropriate that it's done as through this committee um, with uh, reports from the Auditor General or from ministers. No, Bill Bowman. Thank you. Good morning. Um, can I just um, pick up on the point you said that you had 96 regulated um, bodies that you look after the appointments That's correct. To? What does that translate to in actual positions? 630 something. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the precise figure. Okay. How many of those would be, have multiple appointments where the same person was in more than one? Um, the last statistics I have uh, show that there were six people with three appointments and there were 36 people with two appointments. Okay. I think that's the end of 2016. 
Um, I could be wrong. That's April. Sorry, it's April 2018. Beg your pardon. It's more up to date. From 663 regulated positions. So it's roughly 14 percent. Mm -hmm. And do you consider multiple appointments are a good thing or a bad thing? And does the process look at this when you're appointing? Yes, um, it does look at it in as much as there's what's called a fit and proper person test, um, part of which is whether the person who might be appointed has the capacity, the time, to devote to the appointment uh, which they're seeking. Um, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? If, if it's the right person for the job, I'm sorry, this sounds trite, yeah. but if, if they're the right person for the job, then it is a good thing. Um, if they're not, or if they're overstretched, it's a bad thing. I mean, the right person for the job, I think, is, is the key thing. But I think earlier on, you spoke about if you get the criteria wrong, then the process will just go ahead. And to me, that's the rather unpleasant phrase of sort of rubbish in, rubbish out. Uh, you know, if you get the wrong person in, nothing will stop that person then getting through. Is that what you're saying? If you set the criteria wrongly, uh, you should get someone who meets the criteria. And if, if that is, in your words, rubbish, then the person you appoint will qualify on that basis, yes. So how do you look at the criteria then? Um, I mentioned public appointments advisors. Um, they are part of the planning process in which the criteria are discussed. Um, they're then put to the Minister for agreement, endorsement. Well, just one last point on that. Yourselves and your advisors, do they have experience in the recruitment or appointments industry? Very much so. Yourselves? I don't. Um, Ian Bruce does. Okay. Ian Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, I would like to explore some of the things that have uh, been raised earlier, just in a little more detail, particularly uh, Mr. Neil was talking about the uh, non execs, the, the other members of the board. Uh, and one of the things that we've noticed in this committee is that it's very, well, it's very important that other members of the board are prepared to challenge uh, and are prepared to speak up and avoid groupthink and proactively say there is something that we're concerned about here. Uh, how do you feel the appointments process actually ensures that the individuals being recruited to the boards are prepared to step up and to make that challenge? Um, convener, it's, it's, I think, frequently one of the criteria, um, and it may be tested in different ways. Um, in some cases, not all cases by any means, um, it is actually tested by some sort of um, role play, if you like, group exercise based on a board, a, a mock-up of, of a board meeting. Um, but even that is no guarantee that in the circumstances in which the newly appointed member finds themselves, they will then do that. There are all kinds of um, potential inhibitors, mm -hmm. um, which brings us back, I think, to the approach taken by the chair. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a chair of a body, and I'm not talking about anybody in particular, um, who is authoritarian, um, tries to squash dissent, doesn't allow, it's like a committee, uh, doesn't allow people to have their say, um, or won't allow anything to be said which is potentially embarrassing, which is a feature of um, some public organisations, um, then it, it is more difficult. Um, this is one of the um, conundrums in the process um, I am actively trying to promote diversity and not just visible diversity, but diversity of approach uh, and background. Um, that means that there's the potential for people to be appointed who might be thought to be a member of the awkward squad, to use a, uh, a well understood phrase. Um, that is not necessarily going to be welcomed by the chair of the board. So one of the big issues is how does the board actually manage the diversity? How does it deal with the diversity? And does that contribute to improved governance or not? That's what we are currently researching. And, but how does, because I think you make an important point there uh, about the, the role of the chair uh, and whether they're receptive. I mean, it would seem to me that the awkward squad is actually a good thing. Uh, it, it prevents a, a, a groupthink mentality. Uh, but how does the appointments process then ensure 
that the chair is actively going to welcome contributions, enable contributions, uh, and then I'll ask you about appraisals and onward planning in a second. Okay. Um, the appointments process itself can only contribute to that at the point where chairs are being recruited. Um, we do, I do, uh, contribute to um, meetings which the government have recently set up um, of chairs of bodies from across the spectrum um, where issues like this are discussed. Uh, but I think it can only properly be addressed in the appraisal of the chair's performance, uh, assuming the chair is somebody who's open to behaving in the way that you and I would like them to behave. Um, then that will be tested in the appraisal process. Mm. Could you tell me a bit more about the appraisal pr process? We touched on it in, in an earlier question. And certainly, uh, uh, Section F of the Code of Practice uh, suggests that there should be some kind of ongoing appraisal process. But what I was hearing was that almost once the recruitment piece has happened, that's yep. when you step away. Who does the appraisal process? And are you confident that appraisals are actually happening to a level that we would hope? Um, like you, I'm dependent on what I'm told by the Scottish Government, the officials in the Scottish Government, because it is the government officials who are responsible for the appraisal process. Um, I think I mentioned before, um, somebody identified as the senior sponsor in the appropriate department will be the person who conducts at least an annual appraisal uh, of the chair of the body. Um, I don't have any detail on how that is conducted. But do you have a view on whether the appraisal processes are actually happening to the to I, the? I level don't. I'm assumed? sorry. I, I don't have that information. Um, I presume they are, but I, I can't say that on the basis of evidence. I don't have that information. Thank you, Colin Beatty. Thank you. Since we're so enthusiastic about process, I'd like to continue on that. Um, I see five areas where uh, commissioners involved in uh, in these boards, and maybe I'd like to go through that. Under the 2003 Act, the commissioner regulates appointments of non-executive members to the boards of public bodies. So, in terms of that, you you regulate and own that process in terms of the appointments and the government administers it, presumably based on the, on the, on the what you, whatever you regulate as, as the process. Is that correct, simplistically? Simplistically, it is correct. Um, ministers are expected to follow the code of practice for uh, ministerial appointments, which, as I said before, was drawn up in consultation mm -hmm. with Scottish ministers at the time and the parliament. Um, where they don't, um, and if I consider that the failure to follow it is material, a material breach of the requirements of the code, um, I actually have to report to the Parliament, I have to submit a report to the Parliament, um, if I think there is no prospect of the breach being remedied. Now, you talk about the code of practice. Obviously, you own the code of practice because you're responsible for enforcing it, as you said just now, yeah. if there's a deviation. You also give statutory guidance on the application of the code, yes. which again the government's expected to follow. You oversee the selection process by assigning a public appointments advisor. You conduct audits and thematic reviews. Looking at this in the round, just, just looking in, it doesn't seem that the government's really got very much leeway you're laying down the process, the regulation, the guidelines, codes of practice, uh, and the government simply has to follow that. In effect, um, I would have said, looking at, just looking from the outside as a, as a layperson, that you own the process. You own the whole process of appointment. Um, I think the flaw in that characterization of the process um, is that it's actually um, instituted and finalized and run by or, or on behalf of ministers. Um, and the 
other factor um, which I would argue um, needs to be taken into account is that the code itself is very flexible as to how the criteria are set, um, how the assessment is done and, and how the post is advertised. So there is a great deal of flexibility within the system. Now, um, presumably you monitor that, yes. at least on a sample basis. Yes, I, I realise hundreds of... But at least on a sample basis, you're monitoring that, so you're satisfied that that was followed. Yes. But coming back to this, you own a huge chunk of this. You have direct, direct control over it, which is why I'm a bit confused as to why you don't have an easier system of intervening where things go wrong. I mean, what happens when, I, when somebody complains about a board member? Do, do people ever complain to you about a board member? Um, I wear several hats when I'm at work, um, and one of them involves dealing with complaints about the conduct of board members. Um, and if it's within my remit, um, in other words, a, an alleged breach of the code of conduct for that board, um, I investigate, and if I think there's a breach of the code, I report to the Standards Commission. And do you think that uh, the pr that particular piece of the process is adequate at the moment? I have no reason to suppose it's other than adequate, uh, but I haven't mm. actually received very many complaints uh, over the years I've been in post uh, about that particular. I, I guess the concern that's being expressed is very similar to the concern that we've expressed before about the internal audit process. You have a perfect process. Everybody ticks all the boxes and gets it right. But at the end of the day, what comes out the other end isn't fit for purpose. And that's what, that's what this committee's found in serial cases with boards that we've been dealing with, that we've had here in front of us. I, I don't accept that that is true also of the process for dealing with breaches of the code of conduct. Um, there is no evidence that there are wholesale breaches of, of the codes of conduct. But we have, we have evidence that boards are not doing their job, that, they're, that they have failed in their duty. And that is a different, to go back to where you started, a, a different process. The code doesn't say you must do an excellent job. It says you must, per, must perform your role in certain ways and there are certain things you must not do such as conflict of interest, which I know is interest this committee. Um, but that is specified that you're required to register certain interests, which I'm sure you're familiar with um, as a, an MSP and a former councillor. Um, you're required to register certain interests and in certain circumstances you must declare them. I think what's frustrating is we've got all this, the process and the regulations and the codes of practice and all these other things, but clearly... It's not working. Um, I appreciate the frustration, convener. Um, I can't speculate on why mm. things go wrong. Things go wrong, in, regrettably, in, in, in all walks of life. Um, do, do you think, given the fact that uh, this is now extended across quite a number of public bodies that this, this committee has looked at, that perhaps there'd be some merit in revisiting how all this works to see if it can, if it can be done better. Do you mean the appointments process, Mr. Yes, the appointments yeah. process. Um, I would have no argument if you think it would be worth re-examining to see if it could be done better. Um, I think it delivers what it sets out to deliver. Um, if it's aiming at the wrong target, then um, that's certainly something which it would be for the Parliament to identify. I think, I think it's you, not delivering what the public are looking for, but I'll leave it there. Do you think that re-examination, Mr Thompson, would require a re-examination of the 2003 Act, which designates your powers? That's one possibility that the Code itself could be, um, the Code of Practice could be re-examined without re-examining the Act um, I would point out that the process in England and Wales was re-examined um, 
ironically by the chair of a Scottish uh, financial institution um, and has been adjusted recently. Um, I'm not a fan of the system down there, let's put it that way. Okay. Kenny Gibson. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Convener. In fact, you just touched on the issue that I was going to ask about, which is obviously your um, role and remit is determined, Mr Thompson, by the 2003 Act. And I was just wondering, uh, in terms of public appointments, whether you felt there was anything that could be tweaked in that Act, perhaps, uh, uh, to try and improve your, your the way you um, kind of oversee the, the delivery of these public appointments? Um, Convener... I think Mr Gibson's point is probably one I've tried to address already. I don't feel that I'm hamstrung in performing my role as Commissioner for Public Appointments under the Act. I appreciate that's a different issue from whether it's delivering what you think is required by way of uh, effective boards. I think, Mr Thompson, what you're saying to me is that's a matter for us as politicians to determine and to see if the Act needs strengthening or not. You're doing your job, is that correct? I am, and I don't feel I'm inhibited in doing it, convener. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically what you're saying is if the, pr if the process to be improved, you really have to re look again at the legislation. There's something post-legislative that is uh, causing some of the concerns that have been raised by committee members. I, I appreciate that's within this committee's remit. Convener, that's not what I was meaning to say, um, and I'm not looking to, um, f to find an argument here. Um, the process, the public appointments process, um, is set out in the Code of Practice. That can be adjusted without adjusting the Act. It doesn't mean that the Act is perfect, but uh, it is possible to make adjustments to the public appointments process without having to look at the Act. OK, so how can it be improved in that regard, then? Um, uh, well, <laughs> most of what uh, we do, actually, is, is trying to seek improvements to the process. Um, and we have introduced quite a number of things um, with the cooperation agreement um, of the um, Scottish Government officials who are involved in it. Um, I mentioned already um, earlier engagement. Um, there is also, um, and although we're not so involved in this, there's a smarter sponsorship initiative within the government uh, which ought to improve the quality of the... Um, communication and the relationship between the appropriate government department and the public body, uh, and that may actually involve looking at the appraisal issue, which obviously is of interest. Um, we have prompted um, new guidance on succession planning by boards, uh, and I appreciate it's not the responsibility of boards to get the right people, but if they are able to identify what their needs are going forward and to make that plain to the Minister or to the Department, then it's much easier for that to be properly reflected when an appointment round comes up. Um, and the other thing we're trying to do is um, a big issue, which is to improve the diversity of those who are appointed to public boards. Um, we do that through outreach, through trying to make sure that the way that the selection process is conducted doesn't directly or inadvertently eliminate uh, certain people who might otherwise be attracted to it, for example, even in the use of language, uh, can be off-putting to some people. Um, as I said before, too many criteria narrow down the field. Um, that is quite a challenge. That, that requires resources. Um, we actually have a very small resource. Um, Ian Bruce is the only full-time person in my office involved in that. He has part-time support uh, and roughly a third of my time. So most of the, back to uh, Mr Beattie's question, um, there's no way that, that we actually run the process. We're a very small part of it. And just lastly, I was going to ask Mr Bruce specifically, are there any improvements that you've sought to try and bring in but you've been unable to for whatever reason? Um, so as I indicated earlier, uh, we are encouraging the government to do more in terms of lessons learned um, because it is vitally important that we learn as we go along uh, in terms of attraction in particular, uh, as well as just making the process bias-free. Um, and I suppose this to an extent speaks to some of the discussions that we've had today. I, I, I have no doubt in my own mind I've been engaged in this um, activity for quite some time now, uh, and I've seen a lot of improvements in it. There is definitely room for improvement, um, but I have no doubts whatsoever that the 
talent is out there. Um, and um, some of the activity that I would like to see um, <coughs> improved on, perhaps more done, uh, would, would be outreach and encouraging people who haven't considered applying for these roles to put themselves forward. And then obviously we need to make it as straightforward as possible for people to apply when they do. Um, um, application numbers have certainly been rising. Uh, but I think there is scope for many, many more people to, to put themselves forward and, and potentially be successful. Um, because at the end of the day, the outcome of any given appointment round is only going to be as good as those uh, who decide that, you know, it's they want to take up that sort of position in public life. Okay. Do you yeah. have anything further to add to that, Mr. Bruce? No. You, okay, Mr. Gibson? No, it's fine. Okay, you. Mr. Neil, briefly, please. Two quickies. <coughs> First one, a factual one, a Bill. Um, the senior civil servant who chairs the selection panel, is that normally the same civil servant who is the who would do the interviewing of the chairman, for example, as the sponsoring civil servant? Um, in the highest profile rounds, um, the chairs of the largest, highest profile public bodies, um, it is generally the director general who will chair the appointment panel. Um, and as I understand it, the senior sponsor is likely to be somebody slightly lower down the uh, hierarchy. So it's unlikely that it would be the same civil servant who would chair the selection panel who would then monitor the performance? I just don't have the information. I'm sorry, convener, I'm not trying to evade it. Right. Um, I would have thought if things were requiring a lot of uh, high profile uh, or acquiring high profile I, I would have thought a very senior person would do it, but I, I just don't know. Right, OK. And the second very sharp question is, obviously Westminster has adopted a policy for the senior positions whereby they require the, the ministerial nominees require the approval of the relevant uh, select committee. Um, in your opinion, is that a, a useful additional tool? Convener, that's not a quickie. I'm sorry, but I do have an answer. Um, It has been introduced three times in the last couple of years in this parliament. Um, my office calls it dual scrutiny. Um, at Westminster, it's called pre-appointment because at Westminster, as I'm sure Mr. Neil knows, in most cases, um, the minister can decide whether to proceed with the appointment even if the committee does not favor the nominee. Uh, under the dual scrutiny approach here in those three cases that I've mentioned, uh, the Parliament effectively has a veto. If the Parliament says, I don't approve this candidate, the Minister cannot proceed. Um, there will be circumstances, I think, where that is appropriate. Uh, what I have been arguing for behind the scenes is a more strategic approach to that so that there is clarity as to the circumstances in which that kind of approach is appropriate. And it is not introduced in other cases because it introduces a complication and a risk uh, the complication, obviously, is that there's another part of the process. That adds time to the whole process. The risk is that the committee, no matter how well briefed, um, and I'm not talking about any individuals here, but a committee might decide to disapprove um, a candidate on grounds which were not set out in the criteria for appointment. That then damages the integrity of the process and there's evidence that what has happened with pre-appointment hearings at Westminster is that committees, although they initially, in my terms, behaved very well, stuck to the script, um, they became more aggressive and the whole process became more politicised. At that point, there's a risk of discouraging people who might otherwise be prepared to put themselves forward. And if the, what we're trying to do is improve the diversity of people across boards, then we need to be careful not to add in um, an unpredictable barrier which might discourage people from less traditional backgrounds from putting themselves forward. Yeah. And needless to say, I don't entirely agree with you in that, Bill, but I accept it's your point of view. Thank you. Mr Thompson, I don't know to what extent you follow the detail of the situation at NHS Tayside, but the most recent uh, row, if you like, about what, what has happened there... Um, was started by um, the fact it came to light that money had been transferred from the endowment charitable fund 
to the core budget of NHS Tayside for use on an IT project. It also came to light in those reports that the trustees of the charitable fund had a dual role as members of the NHS Tayside board. Now, there are questions um, hanging now um, as to whether that is appropriate. As commissioner, would you see that, that dual role as appropriate for people on public boards? Um, I am aware of the detail, uh, convener. Um, ironically, um, one of the reasons for that dual role is actually set out in the 2003 Act under which I operate, and that was another part of that statute. Can you enlighten um, us as to that reason? Um, I think it is perfectly possible for the system to work properly. Um, it depends on the extent to which the trust purposes, if it is a trust, um, overlap with the role of the health board. Um, if they overlap, then yes, there is a risk of conflict of interest, and I know that that is something which the Office of the uh, Charity Regulator is, is looking at mm. uh, in terms of the trustees' role. Um, on the other hand, the difficulty if people were to decide that the system could not work, and I do think it can work, um, I think it does work actually in quite a number of health boards, I suspect Mr Neil knows far more about this than I do. Um, if you were to change the system, you would probably need another board of trustees mm. for the endowment, which of course means finding more people. Um, and it is possible, as I understand it, that role is not remunerated at the moment. Um, where are you going to find these people for all of the health boards? Um, the other thing is that I'm aware that when um, appointees to the health board um, are told about this, they have the option not to take up the position as trustee um, my understanding, and I don't have detailed knowledge of this, is that nobody has yet declined. Um, that may change. So, given what happened at NHS Tayside and the reports in the media were that the um, trustees felt obliged, um, given the tenor of the meeting, to, to make that transfer, do you think? Do you th do you think there is a failure of governance there? Um, convener. I would like to take the fifth or whatever it is on that. Um, there is still um, a theoretical possibility that I may receive a complaint um, that somebody on the board okay. um, has failed to comply with the board's code of conduct. Uh, and in those circumstances, I would rather not express any opinion at this stage. Okay, I understand. Can I ask you then, um, I was a little surprised in your evidence earlier when you talked about the appointment of chairs, I mean, these chair of the SPA and the chair of many health boards are huge public appointments um, in Scotland of, of great significance. I was a wee bit surprised to, to hear you say that this work is, it sounds like to me, delegated to the 13 appointment advisors in your office. I, I think I would have expected, and I don't know if maybe the public would expect, maybe someone more senior yourself as a commissioner, especially in these big roles like the chairs, to, to be involved in, the, in that process yourself. Is, is there any scope for that? Um, <laughs> two answers to that. One is I already work slightly more than five days a week. Um, so that would be, uh, in practical terms, a little bit of a problem. But I think the real difficulty is that um, as Mr Bowman inquired, um, I'm not an expert in um, selection and appointment. The public appointments advisors are. Uh, they're recruited um, actually across the UK as it happens. Um, they have significant expertise. Um, they, uh, they have access to a lot of guidance from within the office from, from me and Bruce who's sitting on my left. Um, we have meetings with them uh, every few months at which we discuss um, issues which have arisen and issues which we anticipate. 
We receive a report from them at the end of each appointment round, um, and they are very carefully assessed in some detail um, as to their performance in those appointment rounds. Um, so I actually think they are the best resource, um, and, and uh, an awful lot better than I would be able to contribute. Um, some of them are extremely politically aware as well, um, others are, have been less close to the political process. Might I add to that? Yes. Um, so they are, to an extent, also slightly arm's length from the Commissioner. Um, in the event that someone raised a complaint, so let's say, for example, uh, the view was that um, I, as the full-time member of staff within the Commissioner's office, sat in directly on appointment rounds. If someone raised a complaint about how that appointment round had been conducted, it would be because it's also my role to investigate complaints of non-selection is the usual reason that people um, feel aggrieved. It would be very difficult for me to sit and oversee an appointment process and then subsequently investigate a complaint in which I'd been directly involved. Final question, uh, Mr Thompson. Committees, as you can gather, and as you know, is very concerned about poor governance, I think, as we would characterise it in several boards across across the country. You, from your evidence today, I get the impression that you feel the appointments process is, is working, um, and perhaps it's a job for us if we feel it's not. What do you think has led to these failures in governance? <laughs> um. I'm not sure if that's something on which I'm entitled to have an opinion, okay. convener. Okay, fair enough. I thought I'd ask anyway. Can I thank you both very much indeed for your evidence this morning? I now close the uh, meeting, the public session of the committee. Thank you. Thank you.